everybody. Welcome to Lunch and Learn 32. Nice to see everyone coming in. We've got a time lapse of video on the uh, screen right now of the actual dam that we'll be talking about today with Brad Breslow from Davy Mit Davy Mitigation. <clears throat> Still got folks coming in here. We do indeed. Not seeing a lot of names I recognize. New people, yay. <laughs> 11 o'clock. Oh, Lordy. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's always got that going, uh, Brad, so I give her trouble every time uh -huh. I hear it. I have a little talking clock that tells me what time it is. It's very helpful. <laughs> I know that I can now stand up, get out of your chair. That's the time every hour and a half hour after that. <laughs> it's been kind of cool to see the response to this uh, webinar. It's been a really, um, a lot of people interested in this topic, which is, which is cool. Please fill out the poll while you're hanging out or just give maybe one or two more minutes. There's Ben Rumi. Yay. There's someone I know. Hi, Ben. Um, yeah, so why don't you give a little description of the video as we let folks get in here, Brad? Yeah, sure. So, um, this is a time lapse camera that we had set up. Um, gosh, we put it up earlier this spring, knowing that we were like you were working our way through the approval and the permitting process. That, um, so you know, if I go back to the beginning, you can see clearly the dam in place and a, a photo was taken every 30 minutes since, you know, since we set it up. Um, and just basically we put it in place so we could capture the actual removal process. Right. So you guys can see uh, every 30 minutes, it takes a photo. And then I had it running going through the active construction process, which was September, October of this year. Mm -hmm. Nice. Chris and I, Great. I think we can get officially started if you want to. Yes. Take a beat here. Yeah. All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone, to our Lunch and Learn. What number is it? Number 32. 32 times we've done this. Um, really happy to have you here. Seeing a lot of new names, which is great. And um, really stoked that Brad... Breslow of Davy Davy Mitigation is joining us, and I'll do an intro of him uh, shortly. My name is Kristen Hazard. I am the founder and CEO of WildNote. WildNote is a wonderful platform for you to collect data and report on that data to regulatory agencies for the process of environmental compliance, environmental restoration uh, research. Um, we are uh, we we touch it all. And um, we actually have customers that touch two aspects of this project. Um, so we've got some fishery customers that utilize the platform to um, document their fish counts and so forth. And then we also have some mitigation banking customers that use our, what we call a success criteria, but really might be uh, better renamed as performance standards. So folks go out there, collect the data with the platform and we uh, merge it all together for you with um, invasive status and uh, indicator statuses and so forth. And um, we can actually save you weeks of, of time putting all that data into Excel. So um, if you are doing any projects like that, uh, especially ones that are starting up because it's it's easier to get started with a project on the platform than to do it mid process, but we can do both. And so um, that's our hook into today. And um, I'm here with Nancy Douglas, say hello. Hey everybody, glad to have you here. She is our co-founder and director of customer success. She likes to make everyone happy. Um, if you have not completed the poll yet, please take a moment to fill it out. And now I'll get to Brad. So Brad uh, received his BA in environmental science from Carthage College in 2008 and a master's in geography from West Virginia University in 2011. He has over 13 years of experience as an ecologist and project manager specializing in the implementation of stream, wetland, buffer, 
and nutrient mitigation projects. He has extensive experience with full delivery projects and mitigation bank development across the Eastern US. His project implementation experience includes the permitting and construction of over 50 miles of stream restoration and over 500 acres of wetland restoration. He currently serves on the board of the Kentucky Ecological Restoration Association and as the president of the North Carolina Environmental Restoration Association. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So we like to get started with the short sort of story from the field. You got one for us, Brad? Yeah, um, I was going to say we were just talking about one of the biggest things on a project like this is a lot of planning for construction. And um, as you guys will see, it takes years of planning and thought process and coordination. And um, for a dam removal of this scale, dewatering is a really important piece of it. So that was probably the biggest concern and unknown on one of our uh, components when going to construction. And what I was just explaining to Kristen and Nancy is this is an old dam. It was a hazardous dam, but it had been in fairly great shape up until about two months. We were about to start construction and this dam naturally breached during a, flow, uh, a flood event. So for us, it's actually a, a field event, a field story that's a positive for me that it kind of um, helped deal with some of the unpredictability that we got two and a half months of natural drainage on this dam before we started the actual dirt moving and uh, removal. It also actually helped a lot with upstream landowner coordination. So one of the things too, it's hard to, a picture says a thousand words, right? So you don't really know what you're going to expect until something happens. When this started to breach and the water, you know, the dewatering started to happen, it made it a lot easier to go explain to landowners, like, this is what it's going to look like instead of it being kind of a very rapid change. Um, yeah. So yeah, with this project, that's what comes to mind. That was a big piece for us. That was a, a win, a success uh, a successful field story. Was the breach from the hurricane, did you say? It wasn't. It was just a really, um, no, it was like a month and a half before that. It was just mm. a big flow event. It was just a big storm. And mm -hmm. the stop gates on this were literally just old wooden timbers. It's a big concrete dam, but there was some uh, dewatering structures that were just old and they have about 30 to 40 year lifespan usually. And we are right about at that point. And we're not the owners of the dam. You know, we just did the project. We just had the rights to do the removal. So we didn't yeah. actually control that. We had no control of that until we had our permits. It just naturally happened. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. uh, nature. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, uh, gosh, we've been seeing, I went to a dam removal project, um, presentation, the one up in Northern California, um, and uh, literally cried uh, during the presentation. It was so moving and emotional, the, the fish running and the tribal lands, you know, being able to utilize that for their, um, their uh, economy and so forth and food. So um, there, it's just a real amazing, cool topic going on in our industry right now. And we were hoping you could start out by just giving us, you know, info about the, about your project, your dam removal project. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I don't think I will bring you to tears today. I don't <laughs> think so, but. Uh, Let's see, Brad, where I'm at I'll in do, the, I'll, in the crying cycle. <laughs> I'll do my best, but I'll just like for, big picture for everybody. The way that I was kind of thinking about talking about it is a few common th like threads through it is like, the ecological significance of dam removal projects like this, uh, the framework and mechanism that a company like mine was able to, you know, fund and engage in a, a removal like this. Um, and then I think for a lot of folks on this call, just kind of like the, how we document what, how do, how we define and document success on a, you know, large scale restoration, ecological restoration project like this. So, um, it's, it's like I've told Kristen and Nan, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's interesting to note that I think you shared with us, this is the first time a dam has been used as a mitigation bank dam removal. Is that true? Yeah, and I, and I think the, the way to characterize it of this scale in this Army Corps district. So there's often going to maybe be like farm impoundments and things like that that have been, you know, restored back to, to streams. But something of this scale on a river system like this that is the the driver for the mitigation credit it is the first of its kind in the in this district you have a picture um, of where this is yeah so and again like 
as you you both know, I prefer like open ended questions and more conversation, but a little geographic context. So uh, this is in the Norfolk district, which is in, um, Virginia, and it's actually just north of Richmond, Virginia, in a town called right outside of a town called Ashland. Um, it's on the dam itself is on the South Anna River, which is a fifth order river, which is a general it's a 452 square mile uh, drainage area river, which in the context of stream restoration projects is a very large system. Um, a little bit of history of the dam. It was the version that was there that we, uh, we just removed. It's like I need to change the tents I talk about the dam in. But the dam that was there up until about a month ago. Uh, was built in 1916, um, but there were versions of it dating back to the early to mid 1800s that were um, in some of the pictures you'll see. They're like timber uh, crib and rock dams that were just some version to help facilitate um, hydromechanical power for a grist mill. So grain was made in that building for um, for the local economy. And the picture on the left is showing the actual impoundment shape that that dam was impacting. So it was over 12,000 linear feet of river that was effectively a large lake, a pond. And then on the right is showing the general uh, hydrologic unit. That, that's the entire York River Basin that uh, when we get to the mitigation banking context, uh, this site is being used to generate mitigation credits that can offset impacts in those eight digit hydrologic units. So that's mm -hmm. that's what the map on the right is. Um, mm -hmm purposefully blurry picture because it's an old picture that I didn't take that like that just gives you the geographic a historical context of behind that you can even see old dam um sorry old mill buildings and things like that it was a whole complex and you can see um the dam this is a picture that we had taken earlier this spring from the camera that I said we had set up so uh 13 feet foot tall over 200 foot width across um and then on the right, you can see those are the structures that was like the dewatering mechanism that you can't see from this photo, but there are stop logs in there that you can remove mechanically to, you know, dewater the impoundment. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go through a fairly rapid history of my company's involvement with this. So uh, based on various agencies you talk to, this has been a high priority removal for over 30 years. Some of our project partners have been trying to find funding to get this dam out since the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, but us, we identified it as an opportunity in uh, 2021. And for those familiar with the mitigation banking process, we submitted a prospectus document. And that is generally kind of your proof of concept on how you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, why it's a good play, you know, all that very basic, but not a design, not an engineering document. It's really just a, the beginning of the conversation with the agencies. Brad, does um, that go to the Army Corps? Where's that prospectus go? It starts with the Army Corps. And in Virginia, they actually they co-chair it with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. So depending uh -huh. on what district there's. a, But yes, it starts with the core. Yeah. Um, and then they put out what's called a public notice, which any of you working in the permitting environment know that, you know, it's literally uh, request for public comment. So not only agencies, but the general public and anyone, because as you know, the waters of the U S we are all owners yeah. of that. Right. So it's mm -hmm. like that, that's the process. How um, much public comment did this project get? A lot. <laughs> uh, that could be a whole other presentation, but a lot, <laughs> um, good and bad, you know, a lot of, a lot of great questions. A lot of people have very, uh, still have very like um, personal relationships with this river and the way that it was with the dam there. So there's a lot of what's it gonna look like when it's done. A lot of folks are huge advocates. Back to the tribal component, we had five different letters of support from five historic tribes in the area based on um, intrinsic and instrumental value to their peoples, right? So not just commercial fishing value, but also this is, you know, that, that was a big part of it. We had a lot of tribal support for this, I will say. Um, yeah. So part of that process too, you get an evaluation letter um, and you go through this to all this to say that we submitted our first like engineering plans uh, at the end of last year um, in October. And then we just got it approved this summer. So for those that are fairly, any are, have familiarity with the mitigation banking process, um, Shameless plug for us. It was fairly rapid to get it approved. It, like I think it was a great 
review team to work with. And I think we checked a lot of boxes from all those comments we got back in 2021 and 2022. Um, and then we completed um, construction. Right. There's a well, quick question. What was the top reason why you were able to get it uh, fast, fast tracked? Hmm. Honestly, um, most of the constructive but critical comments that we got from that public notice and in that initial evaluation letter, uh, for lack of a better term, we pretty much conceded on every aspect of it. And we just, um, there were some mm -hmm. things that might have been aggressive, for lack of a better term, in the first proposal on crediting and service areas and things like that. And we just kind of, um, it's a compromise, I guess we met yeah. in the middle. And right. um, I mean, I would give recommendations to anyone who permits mitigation banks, you need to stay focused on like our private needs and what we were trying to get done. But it was a meet meeting in the middle, I would say. Yeah. The big reason. Okay. There's a question um, here from uh, one of our attendees. Does the prospectus go to the respective USACE contracting officer or is there a different contract avenue or contact avenue? Sorry. Is there a different, different contact avenue? What's con I don't know contracting officer, what that means in that, <laughs> in that context, unfortunately. Okay, Maybe. we'll come back to it once they put in a yeah some more information. That'd be great. Mean, yeah, but I mean, like the the big picture generally in most mitigation banking uh, processes in the in the districts I work in, it's like eight or nine of them. You'll generally have one primary contact that will be your project manager for that, and they'll they'll handle the prospectus, and then they'll be your permit writer essentially um, through the process. So I, I dealt with one person, um, and then that person's supervisor through this whole process for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's keep going, moving. Yeah. 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 Um, honestly, like this is probably the, the, the best take home of the whole thing, the ecological significance. So um, like I said, the impoundment was actually measured at about 12,000 linear feet. So over two miles of not dead because it's still, you know, there's still like fish species and things like that, but a, a inappropriate aquatic community for a river system of this size. So there's essentially two and a, almost two and a half miles of pond where it should be a river. So we restored that. Um, some amazing tools that have come out of the um, Chesapeake, in, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, I think the Nature Conservancy has the primary one that helps you document what they call functional network miles. So depending on the life history and life strategy of certain fish species, you know, they prefer certain smaller order tributaries and things like that. So when you actually look at this map and you open up that dam, we're not just opening up that 12,000 feet. There's actually, you know, the one model has over 200 miles of, of river that's been opened up to be used by striped bass, American shad, herring, alewife, all these different species. Um, the water quality stuff is kind of a no brainer. Um, rivers are you know this river is going to be shallower and there's going to be more oxygen and free flowing you know turbulent water so we're measuring that though we're documenting that um just talked about the fish species and then there are three uh species of mussels that are federally or state um threatened and endangered that had historic habitat that preferred rivers so they're yeah. documented occurrences um the temporal aspect of restoring mussel populations is tricky and complex so I'm a realist that I don't know that we will see that in our lifetime of the project that we're monitoring, but theoretically, if you build it, they will come. And this is improved habitat for three federally and state endangered mussel species. Um, and then a story I'm pumped about, I'm partnered with a local college that's doing all, all of the fish monitoring. So I've taught, I'm in the second semester of co-teaching a class with uh, Chaz Gowan, who's a professor at Randolph-Macon College. And I think this will turn into a five to 10 year kind of collaboration with them. I'm not just doing it to support the mitigation banking instrument work, but also some additional uh, above and beyond research and teaching opportunities. That's super cool. That's been fun. That's uh, a bet. Yeah. So back to the um, question before. Yeah. The person was trying to figure out the best point of contact for submitting a prospectus. Oh, sure. So depending on what district you're in, um, there's going to be a regulatory core contact. And some of them might even have like by region you're at in that district, like who you would. So um, generally go to like the regulatory 
uh, the Army Corps regulatory website, depending on what district you're in, and you can find a contact that probably handles receiving a mitigation banking prospectuses. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to, yeah, so this piece is um, super fascinating to me, Brad, the the bank aspect of essentially what I think I'm getting from you is it made it possible to get this yeah. project done that people had been wanting to get done for 30 years. So could you could you speak on that? Yeah, absolutely. And Greg, Greg seems that he just asked basically that same question. So I put up all those all that text as like an example of like, it's not an easy button to get it done. It's actually a pretty complicated process, but it is a way to get it done. And for us, um, I guess a, a way for folks to understand there was zero public dollars invested in doing this. So my company sees an opportunity that there will be mitigation credits that can be sold in this service area. So other stream impacts coming from permitted impacts in the watershed, and we, as you know, a big part of my job is vetting with my boss and my team investment opportunities in mitigation banks. And this was a place that we thought it was worthwhile doing a bank that is so innovative and outside the box comes with its own challenges when you look at it as a pure investment opportunity. But we were open to like that challenge and, and working with the regulators to, and, you know, that we ha also had great feedback at the prospectus stage that this isn't ready. You guys aren't close enough, but we think we could work with you on it. So we saw a business case to do it. And we saw a regulatory community that we were excited to work with to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and then we could get a, a predictable credit yield and kind of model out that we think there would be enough credit sales through the lifespan of our costs to make it a, a worthwhile. Now, I'm not going to say they couldn't have done it with grant funding. There's just multiple examples of my some of my project partners we're doing the monitoring and uh, the baseline. Sorry, I got a cap here. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we had a, um, a baseline credit yield that made sense to us that we knew it would be financially feasible, essentially. Um, Is there then, just a ton of impacts happening in that region or how did it pencil out in that way? Um, it's speculative. So that's the interesting part about mitigation banks. It's like you you generate credits and then you sell them yeah. later, right? So uh, realistically, it's it's a middle of the road market. It's not, uh, um, but anyone who follows this kind of stuff, my company, we spend a lot of times in places you would expect, right? Like in um, development hubs and growth areas and right. Department of transportation impacts. So it has all that kind of stuff and it's... Um, it's not in like a no man's land necessarily. Um, okay. And there are grant funding opportunities to do things like this. Like like what I did want to say, it just seemed that us picking it up this way for the partners we were working with, they almost felt like they're at a point that it might not happen, you know, and this was kind of the way that we ended up finding, finding an opportunity to fund it and get it done. So Davey funds it, essentially puts the upfront money in, to get it done and then uh, plans to make that back by selling the credits. Um, there's a question, how were the total credits determined? So uh, credits were determined via the, the approved mitigation banking instrument. And the, the simplest way to think about it would be the first like, the first line of credits were based on this 12,000 linear foot of restoring a stream. So like that is like the very simple any stream restoration project has some sort of functional methodology credit assessment tool that is often it is generally analogous with the impact side right so you're trying to offset in kind impacts to streams and or wetlands in that watershed so we started with 12,000 linear feet of stream restoration credits and then the norfolk district has a bit of a template for adjustment factors and this had a lot of unique adjustment factors that i would say were bespoke as this project had a project like this had not yet been done. So we have adjustment factors for fish passage. So documenting a striped bass upstream of this dam will come with a credit multiplier, documenting a river, you know, all these types of things. And then they are also not just released immediately. It is as you hit agreed upon success criteria through the life of the bank. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So what in this case for this particular project are the success criteria? Yeah, so I will jump a little bit. Um, it's kind of all tied to these things. So water quality, flow regime, and geomorphology. So I would say those that are like, any folks are like kind of in the weeds on what I keep calling traditional stream restoration projects, like measuring the physical restoration or physical change of a stream, like whether it's bank height ratios and water depths and erosion and things like that. So what we're measuring in the upstream impoundment is documenting decreases in depth, increases in stream velocity, coarsening of the substrate, because before we did this, it was a big old sediment filled pond. And as you restore, you know, natural stream flows, we're going to see ripples form. We're going to see um, heterogeneous habitats and things like that. And what's cool. So that's one thing we're measuring all that, like the, the physical change of an impoundment to a river. Um, and we're doing that with traditional cross sections and pebble counts, but we're also doing um, drone footage to show something of this scale. I keep coming back to a picture. So it's like one of my partners I'm working with who is in the academic world, he's like, what do you mean you need to document it? It's a river when you're done. And I'm like, sure, but we need to actually check some boxes and show it. So that's, we're doing a lot of physical stuff that might sound like a no brainer, but we need to measure it. Um, other success criteria is literal presence absence of these diadromous fish above the dam footprint. Um, something we're using as a proxy for water quality and a proxy for transitioning back to a flowing river versus an impoundment is the aquatic uh, macroinvertebrate community. So uh, aquatic insects have habitat preferences, right? So you will see a transition to functional feeding groups of insects um, over time. So that's another one. Uh, for the rare, threatened, and endangered species, it's some proxies of appropriate habitat. Now, if we document a mussel, like that's going to be an immediate credit release. Like I said, it's in the MBI, but I'm I'm a yeah. realist. I think that will take time. Yeah. Uh, and then one of the really cool ones, Atlantic sturgeon, is a federally endangered fish spe fish species that um, is very well studied. But it, we're not sure that it'll make it this far upstream, so we're uh, putting in some acoustic taggings. But that would be another way that we can get a a rare, threatened, and endangered species credit. Um, oh, cool! So you could get that now. Can you speak on this um, physical sampling and eDNA? Yeah, physical sampling. Uh, great slide. So bottom picture. These are pictures literally below the dam. Uh, Alan Weaver, uh, who's the anadromous fish coordinator for Virginia DWR project partner, that's him catching an American shad below the dam, which is one of our target species. And the second picture is him and Dr. Gowan uh, electrofishing. So that's the way we're doing most of our physical sampling. Yeah. Um, and eDNA we're doing with the college. It's um, I'm a big picture like concept guy. I understand we collect water and then these are known sequences. We got all negative samples upstream of the dam because we know those fish aren't there. And then we will run those samples this spring, you know, after. So all of these species run uh, and do their spawning run in the spring. So we'll do our first post-construction monitoring event this spring. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just literally, Kristen, it's collecting water samples and processing them in a lab and comparing them to um, known negative samples from the same water column, essentially. And the, what what it's going to tell you what fish were there so you have a known sequence so we're doing it with um and one of the ways we'll do it we have like a non-target species that we know is just on both sides yeah and we're kind of using that to show like hey look this blueback chub is here yeah. and there are known sequences so it's by species there's a known sequence and then you run a sample and you can match that it, it's showing up just in the water just in the water and you can do it in other I think that you can do it in soil and other places but it's like yeah scales and poop and fish die and all that stuff and it's just yeah, yeah. is physically in the water so does that mean less of the uh shock fishing what do you call that sorry electro fishing uh you know the way we budgeted and planned no we're doing mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. um and I think bigger picture I think eDNA sampling would be the more cost effective solution eventually yeah, but um, we're kind of doing both for a few reasons, but um, I don't think is so. Is that a new? Is that new though? eDNA, is it new? You know, 
I'm not the best. At, it's it's been showing up on some East Coast dam removals. I guarantee they're doing some of that work in uh, out west. I'm sure that's been done for a lot of the projects with some of the um, like salmon passage and stuff like that. I think it's it's a very it's a growing technology. I think it's showing up in a lot of restoration projects. Brad Samuel, Samuel, Samuel Lieberg wonders if it was difficult to get the IRT on board with the eDNA sampling. No, and I think it's because I have uh, a third party university doing the work. And that was kind of, um, and that we kind of just showed her and do multiple lines of evidence. And the way our performance standards are written, it's not like a one time hit is all the credits. It needs to be multiple years. And um, so, no, it was, I mean, we got a really detailed scope proposal, like as if we were proposing an eDNA to like the NSF, you know, they gave me a really detailed proposal. So I think that probably helped a lot with working with the regulators. 11.30. Oh my gosh, 11.30. Well, well what some other extent, questions we should move on to, I think, Kristen. Uh, yeah, to what extent did NEPA and ESA permits and regulations play a role? Yes, uh, but they did. Uh, and NEPA for us, uh, you go through the process, but like a private mitigation bank, you kind of check those NEPA boxes essentially in like the upfront stages. The ESA stuff was pretty intense, I'll be honest, because we're working in a system that um, all this uplift I'm talking about are like, there's time of year restrictions and there's all these uh, considerations for the things that we're actually trying to improve. So huge considerations, tons of coordination, but um, got through it all. I mean, these are all, the cultural resources was very complicated. Uh, I was literally working under a DOT bridge, had to get big approval from them. DCR had a dam safety permit requirement. Uh, these were both needing to get waivers on endangered and threatened species within and, and also some riparian, there's some riparian endangered species or any like tree removals for bats or monarch butterfly, you know, so anything you guys could imagine that you would think would be a permitting hurdle probably came up, but we were just able to like, just work through it. And and didn't you tell us at the Venn diagram of the timing, if you were to adhere to all of the special species? Yeah. If I had to meet all the time of year restrictions and all of the endangered species act requirement, section seven and one Oh six requirements, we would have had two weeks to do the project. So, um, on the surface, if you see that, it's impossible, but you just kind of work with agencies and have meet, a lot of meetings and conversations, and we found a window to do it. And um, because so much of the uplift was based on anadromous fish in the spring, we decided September, October was the optimal construction window, and all the agencies agreed with that. So that's, that's kind of how we were able to work through that. Just some common sense, pragmatic conversations. Brad, what restoration activities occurred upstream of the dam removal? Any planting, stabilization, et cetera? Really minimal. Great question. Uh, this, this you can see in the picture that looks like a golf course right now because we just seeded it and uh, watered it. That was the primary uh, bank stabilization that we did. Otherwise, um, not, no riparian uh, work was done. And then we actually permitted if we needed to put any structures in the river to aid with fish passage, because we weren't necessarily sure what the, the bottom was going to be, but it's a bit of a bedrock slide right there that connects and it's a really stable transition. So very minimal in channel work other than the dam removal. And then that wall that we stabilized and planted, we stabilized that with boulders and then did what's called soil lifts on top of it and then planted it. And then we're going to go plant um, native trees on that little grassy green area as well. Is that downstream or upstream? That's looking upstream. Oh, wow. So I was kind of assuming you'd have to do stabilization downstream because the change in the flow. I'll just say for a big talking point about dam removals in general or how much work should be done. This one, we, we that was not part of our permit requirement was to do much upstream. Now, okay. we are doing some coordination with some, some folks on... Um, some minor, not, not related to the MBI at all, but some minor alterations to helping folks like access the river again, if it's like steeper slopes and things like that, but no, right. no permit requirements to do that. How confident are you in meeting your success criteria and are these criteria derived from past successes? That's a great question. Uh, 
pretty, pretty darn confident, especially in the way that we, um, the way we developed the credit release schedule, it was very thoughtful that we, we feel good about it. That's a good question. And, um, so that credit release schedule is based on your past experience? As much as it could be on a project that's never been done before. Yeah. I mean, based mm -hmm. on things that we expect to work and based on mm -hmm. um, the, the, the project team we put together. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't have a better term other than sandbagging. I mean, there's a little bit, you, you, you shoot for the moon in an MBI, but our like financial model understands that we might not check every box and we're okay with that. So it's kind okay. of, the answer is both. Right. So we, we, uh, we hope we get everything. And if we don't, it's not a failure. Got it. Go ahead, Nancy. Nancy, you want to ask the last question? Oh, uh, from Greg. Great questions, Greg, by the way. Why not just put in fish passage instead of removing the entire dam? And I wish Alan was on. That's a good question, Greg. Um, they've tried that on a few. Like, I guess there's been varied success that the experts think that this is just... Um, they would always prefer just removing a blockage than putting like a fish ladder. But like, it's not a bad question. Um, the the experts on this one thought dam removal was a much better mechanism than just, um, you know, physically moving fish or putting a fish ladder or things like that. And then I guess there's some data out there that some of the costs associated with some of those, just like keeping the dam in place, but the fish migration mechanisms might not be as financially feasible as one's thought relative to an actual removal as we're getting better at dam removals. So a few answers, but not like a good question. I think you might get different answers depending on who you ask. How long was the construction phase of the, or deconstruction phase of the project? Because we got that help with the dewatering, I was saying it took about six weeks. Yeah, that's so, yes, amazing. Including the stabilization efforts upstream, like of that. that somehow you encountered the strongest rebar you'd ever seen in your in your life or yeah something? our operations manager is like a bit of a history buff and i guess we found out that like rebar might have been like it was like literally invented like the year before they built this dam and we're pretty sure that they use this as their pilot study to see how much rebar <laughs> you need to put in the dam because <laughs> our contractor said he'd never seen that much rebar it looked like a spider web every time you'd move a piece of concrete it was not even gridded it was just like they like let's try it out and it was more rebar than I've ever seen in concrete before. So Greg wonders if, um, what do you think about doing a mitigation bank for removal of the four lower Snake River dams in Pacific Northwest? I think Greg? you should hit me, you should connect with me offline, Greg. I'd love to, I don't know. Um, I don't know that area. I don't know if it's crazy. It's like, we're, we're very, like not, and I say me, it's just, I think the industry in general is looking for, uh, and even if it's not in the mitigation banking context, there's a lot of like steam, you know, there's a lot of um, tailwinds behind getting dams out. And I think there's lots of ways to find, to finding ways to fund them. And if a mitigation bank is the way to do it, and there's a um, a core district that wants to work with you, I think, right. I, mean, I, don't think it, I don't think it's too crazy. You got a local here, Brad, Jessica <laughs> Flester. I'm a restoration ecologist in San Diego, but I'm originally from near Ashland, Virginia area. I used to drive by this dam all the time. Really cool to see this project and can't wait to see it next time I'm visiting home. <laughs> yeah, awesome. thanks for the comment. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, looks really good. Brad, on the, on the subject of uh, Greg reaching out to you, are you available for others who might be interested in this type of thing to reach out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you're you're happy to talk with folks who might be involved in our poll. Uh, we've got about uh, one of the questions is, are you currently involved in a project that has a dam as a component? And there's 45% of the folks on the call are involved in, in a project that is uh, with the dam and 63% are involved currently in restoration projects. Um, so there might be some folks who might want to hit you up for some additional information. You yeah, you can share, share my email. email. You share my email or via... Um, yeah, share your screen. Yeah. Emails. Don't you have his email up there? Uh, yeah, let me grab that up real quick. You, share, you can stop sharing, Brad. Oh, yeah. I wonder if um, if another interesting l, l topic would be the the thing you alluded to, which is sort of agency interaction, tips with for agency interaction. Mm-hmm. But... 
you've learned a lot over the years, Brad. Yeah. And again, I'll just like, there are some hurdles with getting a project. Like this is not going to work in all, some districts. I'll just be blunt about that. Um, yeah. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't. Like, again, something I think I spoke about with you all, like uh, the first time we all spoke is that I'm just generally a proponent of more prescriptive methodologies for stream restoration, depending on the geographic context and where you are. So dam removals might not fit in a box sometimes. And like, I get that if that's not going to fit certain army Corps districts, like playbooks or templates for getting a mitigation bank done. But um, I think I was talking about you guys, like out Western U S I think like beaver dam analogs make more sense in the East coast. It's more natural channel design. I just think, there's certain types of restoration opportunities that might not seem appropriate, might not feel like it's doable. I guess I shouldn't say seem appropriate. Might not, might seem like an uphill battle to get done as a mitigation bank, and I don't always think that's the case if you just have the conversation with the regulators. Right, right on. Right. Hope that made sense. We'll be sending um, out the recording after uh, after this. It'll probably be being in next week. So um, if you want to share this out with anybody else um, that you folks know might be interested in this topic, uh, you'll be able to do that. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Brad, for... Um, yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Project. Right on, Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Happy holidays. Have a great rest, great rest of your uh, day. Bye bye. Thanks bye. in here for you, Brad. Great presentation from Ben. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Take care. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye.